Jotham's prophetic fable, and the long title is Jotham's prophetic fable, The Worthlessness and Calamity of Choosing Pagan Humanistic Rulers. We're going to look at the fable, then we're going to look at some of the uh, things that happen after it, but we're only going to look at uh, verses 7 to 15. Actually, I'll begin reading at verse 1, and it'll stop after 15. Well, I'll stop after 18. <clears throat> then Abimelech, the son of Jeroboam, went to Shechem to his mother's brothers and spoke with them and all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying, Please speak in the hearing of all the men of Shechem. Which is better for you, that all 70 of the sons of Jeroboam reign over you, or that one reign over you? Remember that I am your own flesh and blood. And his mother's brother spoke all these words concerning him in the hearing of all the men of Shechem. And their heart was inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is our brother. So they gave him 70 shekels of silver from the temple of Baal Berith, from, with which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless men, and they followed him. They went to his father's house at Ophrah and killed his brothers, the 70 sons of Jeroboam, on a stone. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, was left because he hid himself. And all the men of Shechem gathered together, all of Beth Milo, and they went and made Abimelech king beside the terebinth tree at the pillar that was in Shechem. <coughs> and here's the beginning of our text, verse 7. Now when they told Jotham, he went and stood on top of Mount Gerizim. Now Shechem's in between two mountains. Gerizim is a lot steeper and a lot closer to Shechem. It's the perfect spot to stand. I'll talk about that in a minute. But he stood on Mount Gerizim and lifted his voice and cried out and said to them, Listen to me, you men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. The trees went forth and anoint a king over them. And they said to the olive tree, reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, Should I cease giving my oil, with which they honor God and men, and go sway over trees? Then the tree said to the fig tree, You come and reign over us. But the fig tree said to them, Should I cease my sweetness and my good fruit, and go to sway over trees? Then the tree said to the vine, You come and reign over us. But the vine said to them, Should I cease my new wine, which cheers both God and men, and go to sway over trees? <clears throat> then all the trees said to the bramble, it's like a thorn bush, You come and reign over us. And the bramble said to the trees, If in truth you anoint me as king over you, then come and take shelter in my shade. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble, and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now therefore, if you have acted in truth and sincerity in making Abimelech king, and if you have dealt well with Jeroboam in his house, and have done to him as he deserves, for my father fought for you and risked his life and delivered you out of the hand of Midian. But you have risen up against my father's house this day and killed his seventy sons on one stone, and made Abimelech, the son of his female slave, king over the men of Shechem because he is your brother. If then you have acted in truth and sincerity with Jeroboam and with his house this day, then rejoice in Abimelech and let him rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and Beth Milo, and let fire from the men of Shechem and from Beth Milo and devour Abimelech. And Jotham ran away and fled, and he went to Bear, Bier, and settled there for fear of Abimelech his brother. Bears on the road from uh, Jerusalem to Gaza. So it's far south. They would never find him there. Thus sendeth the reading of God's holy word. Once again, we find ourselves with an amazing section of scripture that is rich. <clears throat> After Jotham, who's Gideon's youngest son, who escaped the slaughter of all his brothers, was informed that the leaders and people of Shechem had made Abimelech the murderer king, he went to Mount Gerizim with a prophetic message. Mount Gerizim stood above Shechem, and the side facing Shechem has acoustic properties making it possible for the people of Shechem to hear the words of Jotham clearly. I forget how tall it is. I think it's 600 feet, and, you, you got, and it's really close to Shechem. It's very, very steep. And if he stands in a certain spot, he's safe. They can't, they, there's no way he, they can get to him. Uh, he can escape very easily, and yet they can hear him clearly, and they can see him. They can see him, he can see them. It's a perfect spot. 
Now Mount Ger Gerizim, Gerizim was the Mount of Blessing, Deuteronomy 27, 12, where the covenant blessings were read out opposite Mount Ebal, where the covenant curses were read out. That's Deuteronomy 27, 11 to 16. Shechem was located between the two mountains, closer to Gerizim, though. <coughs> but Gerizim was suited for the task because it was much nearer to Shechem, and this made it possible for Jotham to remain at a safe distance, yet he could be both seen and heard. Therefore, in God's providence, the Mount of Blessing becomes a Mount of Judgment. Blessing to the righteous, judgment to covenant breakers. Now, Jotham acted as a lone prophetic voice against Shechem at a time when the nation was at a low point spiritually. When the other tribes learned about this horrible massacre at Ophrah and the making of a heathen, a Baal worshiper, a murderer, king of Israel, they did not raise an army and put to death the Baalite traders from Shechem. And I'll discuss this later, but most scholars believe he was only really ruling over uh, Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, the other tribes really didn't care what was going on. They, were, they had their own problems with idolatry. Their love of sin and earthly pleasures had dulled their consciences. They had made peace with Baal and humanism after the death of Gideon. And thus were willing to tolerate such a scandalous injustice. Without a love of Yahweh, they did not care about the slaughter of the Lord's servant's house. This is not simply murder. It's the murder of a prophetic judge, his own family. However, what Jotham did tells us good things about his character. His story, which is based on analogies between useful plants versus a worthless bramble, with curses coming on Shechem from the bramble, and then, of course, they're going to destroy each other, reveals a biblical approach to a great injustice. Jotham was not a civil magistrate. He was not a judge. He was not a powerful man. Moreover, he lived in a time of great corruption among the civil and religious leaders. They were Baal worshippers. He couldn't turn to them. They were the murderers. He did not expect justice from the civil magistrate and did not act corruptly by taking matters into his own hands. He didn't seek violence from his own self against them. He trusted in God and his word, which taught that those who break the covenant law should be cursed by God. His parabolic speech is so true to scripture, so full of wisdom, and, perfect pro and, and it's perfect prophetically, that some scholars believe he received this message directly from God. It's a prophetic message. Most scholars, however, do think that this message was, uh, they do not think that this message was an inspired prophecy, but rather was a true analogy with a correct conclusion, but it so was so fully rooted in the teachings of Scripture. Either way is distinctly possible. Somebody can have such wisdom and, and know Scripture so well that they can apply it to a situation. However, it seems to be prophetic. <coughs> his methodology was biblical, and his message was covenantally faithful. He stood on the Mount of Blessing to deliver the curse of the covenant law on those vile lawbreakers. Jotham does not seek to personally avenge his brothers because he knows that he does not need to. He knows that Yahweh, the true and living God, will avenge them. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. We don't need to take vengeance into our own hands. If we're not a civil magistrate and we're treated unjustly, we appeal to God, and that's exactly what he does. And we find this thinking uh, in Psalm 94. Listen to this. O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongs, O God, to whom vengeance belongs, shine forth. Rise up, O judge of the earth. Render punishment to the proud. Lord, how long will the wicked, how long will the wicked triumph? They utter speech and speak insolent things. All the workers of iniquity boast in themselves. They break in pieces your people, O Lord, and afflict your heritage. <clears throat> they slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? 
Who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul would soon have settled in silence. If I say my foot slips, oh, your mercy, O oh Lord, will hold me up. In the multitude of my anxieties within me, your, your comforts delight my soul. Shall the throne of iniquity, which d devises evil by law, have fellowship with you? They gathered together against the life of the righteous and condemn innocent blood. But the Lord has been my defense and my God, the rock of my refuge. Verses 1 to 6 and 16 to 21. Read the whole psalm later. It's just outstanding. But that's the attitude. We can't control who's in the White House. I mean, we can do what we can to not have that kind of a person, the bramble that's in there now, the, the lying reprobate that's in there now. We can't do anything, but we can pray. And we can sing imprecatory psalms against him and his administration and the Democratic Party and many in the Republican Party who are in agreement with humanism. There are a number of things about Jotham's prophetic message that merit close attention first. <clears throat> There's his introduction. Listen to me, you men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. Now, although this introduction does not came the pro contain the prophetic, thus says the Lord, or the Lord spoke to me saying, which you find in the prophets repeatedly, It nevertheless is solemn and thoroughly biblical. The word hearken, King James, or listen, New King James, modern translations, Shema, Shama, means not only to listen carefully to what Jotham says, but also carries the idea of listen, understand, agree, and then obey. If the Shechemites listen and then act on, upon what they hear, they will confess confess, repent, and seek biblical restitution. In other words, the conspirators must be put to death, the murderers must be put to death, if they listen, if they repent. If they do not hear and obey, then God will not listen to them, but will judge them. If you listen to the word of God, then God will listen to you. If you listen to the word of God, believe and obey, then God will listen to you. If you don't, God will judge you. Faith requires listening to what God says and then living in accord with it. Faith without works is dead, worthless, counterfeit, non-existent. James 1, 17 to 20. The Solomon says this. This is Proverbs 28, verse 9. One who turns away his, his ear from hearing the law, even his prayers, even his prayer is an abomination. Now, that's a very important verse because most people who are wicked are very religious. Nancy Pelosi talks about how she's a deeply devoted Roman Catholic, and, and so does Biden and all these people. Their prayers are an abomination. When you're working to murder infants on the one hand, and you deny God's law on the, on the other, and you also deny the death penalty for real murderers, uh, your prayer is an abomination in God's sight. Even though his, this prophetic, this parabolic story identify Shechem's sin and folly, and then prophesize judgment. It begins with a message of grace and hope. There's mercy to you if you repent. Now, obviously, if you're a murderer and you repent, you still have to be put to death, but you can go to heaven if you repent and believe. If you believe and repent. There's hope for you if you believe and repent. If you do not believe and repent, you are doomed. The word men in this verse is Bele, indicating that he directs his message primarily to the political and religious leaders of Shechem. They're the people that Abimelech met with. They're the people that financed, they conspired with Abimelech. They financed the killers. They financed the hitman. They financed the operation, the coup. They murdered his brothers, and they put Abimelech on the throne. Now, all the, all the idol worshippers in Shechem were also responsible for their tithes and offerings to Baal were used by the leaders to put out a contract on the house of Gideon. You support evil, you're responsible for evil. People who subsidize evil and support 
wicked apostate political and religious leaders, whether you're in a liberal church, a bad church, or you support the Democratic Party, they're responsible for their wicked policies. Second, the story speaks of three trees that are good, productive, and useful that reject the kingship. These are all trees that are crucial for Israel's economic life in the Old Testament. The three most important trees, or, or, or we should say uh, agricultural products, olive oil, wine. Each tree will reject the kingship for the same reasons, based on their nature or calling from God. They have a genuine desire to do good for the covenant community and thus are not self-seeking or prideful. They don't care about ruling over other trees and dominating them. They're already productive for God. They're already doing good work for God. They're following their calling. Trying to become what God has not called them to will only spoil their usefulness. These men are so wise and biblical in their thinking that they are willing to reject unwise and unbiblical offers of the multitude for the sake of fulfilling their calling by God. One does not serve and help society by giving in to unbiblical desires. Now think of Biden, for example, clearly not called by God to be a president. He's a wicked man, a complete liar, a corrupt politician for the past 40 or so years. But he's useful for the socialists. He's their puppet. Now, the olive tree produces olive oil, which was used for cooking, lighting lamps, medicinal purposes, anointing kings and prophets, as well as various sacred uses. Leviticus 2, 1-16, Exodus 30, 24-25, 35, Exodus 35, 14, etc. The anointing with oil represents the anointing of those uh, called to office by the Holy Spirit, whether a prophet or a king. Each one of these trees represents plants that are fruitful for the good of society, <clears throat> that naturally would be respected, desired, and honored by people who are wise. The people are eager for the olive tree to be their king, but the olive tree is happy and content with being an olive tree. He has no interest in setting aside his God-given calling when Israel already has a king, Yahweh. They reject the kingship because they have a king. In, in the theocracy at that time, they didn't have a king. God was their king. He would much rather continue helping society by fulfilling the role that God has given it. The fig tree is happy and content with producing figs, which are sweet and delicious. If you've ever had a fresh fig, they're just amazing. I lived by a house that had a giant fig tree in the backyard of California, and it was just they're so sweet, it's mind-boggling. He would rather help, he would rather give lawful pleasure and nutrition to the people than set aside, set that aside to be a king. The vine produces wine, which not only cheers God, uh, man, but also God. Now, what Yahweh is pleased with wine, because it was offered to God. Numbers 15, 5, 7, and 10. And it is used to bring cheer to his people. So you anti-wine people out there who think that wine is evil and beer is evil and all these things. According to scripture, you're an unbiblical, you're unbiblical, you're wrong, and you call what God says is great a curse. The vine likes to give joy to the people. <clears throat> and he does not want to give up that up to lord it over others. Gideon and the other judges were content to follow their calling, the calling that God had given them. They had no lust for power and understood that taking the role of a king would take them away from their particular gifts that were already a great service for society. Each of these plants had continual usefulness as they were. And they were wise enough, and they were humble enough, and they were biblical in their thinking enough to recognize it. Third, the story then turns its attention to the bramble, which is obviously the plant that represents Abimelech. The bramble is a thorn tree that produces neither fruit nor good shade. 
the Hebrew term atad comes from the word to pierce. It could refer to the buckthorn tree, which is a very short tree with drooping jagged branches covered with long sharp thorns. It was a kind of tree a farmer would cut down and burn being harmful and worthless. Didn't provide good shade. It was harmful to pets and children. Worthless. In scripture, thorns and thistles, of course, are used to represent the curse that God has placed on the earth due to the fall. And that's going to be Genesis 3.18, Matthew 27.29. The trees which represent the inhabitants of Shechem, especially the leadership, could not convince any good, productive, fruitful trees to rule over them. So they turned to the bramble, a completely worthless and harmful plant that is good for nothing. It's harmful. The bramble, lacking a true understanding of self and being full of pride and wickedness, encourages the trees to come and take shelter in his shade, which of course is a farce. The bramble is delighted with the offer of kingship and promises the inhabitants protection. Now he has no good fruit which is useful for society and thus offers shade, but the bramble is a short, stubby tree, shorter than the other trees, and it's not a shade tree. One is more likely to be pierced by the bramble's thorns than receive comfort into the shade. So the picture of the bramble ruling over the other trees is deliberately an absurd picture. And thus the bramble accompanies his unrealistic promise with a threat. If there is disobedience to his rule, he will consume all the rebels, no matter how powerful and significant they are. The unregenerate apostate makes promises that he cannot fulfill, that are out of accord with reality, and then threatens violence and death against any of those who oppose his authority and terrible leadership. Think of all the brambles in history, Nero, Stalin, Hitler, Pol Pot, Chairman Mao. His supreme arrogance is demonstrated by the fact that he threatens the tallest and strongest of the trees, the great cedars of Lebanon. Now remember, this is a time of old growth forests still existing in Lebanon, uh, and these tree, trees were just mind-bogglingly large and magnificent. Now, some scholars see the reference to cedars as a threat to the ruling class in Shechem, the very people who gave him the money to murder the perceived opponents and seize power. Jotham notes that Abimelech is a man without ethical principles who will rule as evil, evil tyrant, tyrants rule. You want worthless scum? You get worthless scum. He has Abimelech saying, to paraphrase, if all my arbitrary commands are not fully and immediately obeyed, and if you do not abjectly submit yourselves to my autonomous will, then destruction will come out from me, not only on the common people, but also on the elders and the priests. Sure, I'll be your king, but if you cross me, I'll kill you. Sounds more like Al Capone than it does a good leader, doesn't it? <clears throat> the lessons of this brilliant parabolic story are striking. A people who reject God's law, they reject God, they reject his law, are willing to place a lawless tyrant on a throne. When people reject the grace of God and his authority, they end up submitting themselves to satanic leaders. I'm not going to take time to give you examples in history, but we find it throughout history over and over and over again. Whenever Yahweh and his special revelation is not the basis of civil government, the leaders of that nation cannot bear good fruit, glorify God, or rule with justice and equity. They can't. And they don't. In general, we could say that people get the leaders they deserve. They're the leaders they want, and they're the leaders they deserve. All wicked people dedicated to idolatry and sinful hedonism choose leaders that cater to their wickedness. The Democrats have been very successful. The 
They've had very, they run very successful political campaigns on the idea that they will steal to the rich and the upper middle class to give to the poor. And of course, it assumes that the state has the authority to simply tax people the way they want, whether it's just or not. And of course, it also is a great lie because the top 15% of earners in the United States pay about 90% of the taxes already. So the idea that it's simply not fair and we want fairness, is that's just a bold-faced lie. And I'm surprised the Republicans don't continually point that out. And they will make sure promiscuous women can murder their unborn babies for the sake of convenience. Their whole approach to power is predicated on envy, unlawful lust or covetousness, theft, coercion, hatred, and murder. I'm not exaggerating. Similarly, the people of Shechem liked Abimelech because he supported Baalism and human autonomy and ethics. The people of, of America who support the left are secular humanists who believe the state should be the savior, the determiner of ethics and meaning, as well as the mother and father to society. We can't let people have free choices and let the economy prosper with low taxes and low regulations. We need the state to confiscate a bunch of wealth and then use that to have bureaucrats do what they think is good for society. They reject the idea of self-government, of free people making free decisions for their own future. For them, God does not tr determine truth or meaning or ethics. A humanistic elite does. We can't trust you to make up your own mind about how you're going to spend your money. We'll spend it for you. And of course, if you see the way they spend it, it's shockingly stupid and absurd. Aside from the fact that every dollar that's supposed to go to the poor, about you know, 90, 90 cents of it goes to a bureaucracy, and 10 cents go to the poor. And they're not really poor. They're the, un, they're the undeserving poor. They're poor because they're lazy and they take drugs and so forth. Because their views are so contrary to truth and reality, they degrade and destroy virtually every area of life they control. Therefore, we can say that pagan humanists choose their own judgment, and when the judgment comes, they are so blind, they move even deeper into the mire. They won't acknowledge the judgment. They won't acknowledge that they're wrong, even when it's obvious. They are so committed to their humanistic idolatry, they will not acknowledge their sin or foolishness, but instead will double down on their pagan lies. And therefore, they bring on themselves more judgment. As God says, Romans 1, 21, 22, and 26, they became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. I was watching something, and you know, why don't uh, these shopping centers set up shop in uh, black poor communities in the ghetto? Why are they setting up shop uh, in these prosperous areas over here where it's mostly white people? It's, it must be because they're racist. No, it's not because they're racist. It's because if you have a bunch of people come in and steal because it's a lawless culture, you can't stay in business. You can't make money. A whole chain of drugstores just closed in San Francisco because they, people were stealing so much stuff because they don't prosecute theft anymore in San Francisco unless it's over $900. Uh, they, had to, they went out of business. They couldn't make a month. They couldn't make a profit. This point is easily observed in Western nations that have abandoned Jesus Christ in the Bible for secular humanism. Socialism or welfare statism punishes the most productive members of society in order to steal their money and give it away to the least productive. This madness continues even though it is now well established that subsidizing poverty produces more poverty. It not only produces more poverty, but it destroys family life and leads to a great rise in crime. 
and uh, you don't have to believe me on this, just go back and read uh, Thomas Sowell's books on these kind of things. Even when America was far more racist than it is today. Today, racism is actually quite rare among whites. Uh, even when racism was more popular, and even when segregation existed in the 40s and 50s, black families were making great progress economically. And then LBJ and the Great Society came in, and things went took a big downward turn. It leads to an antinomian system where criminals, drug addicts, and rioters are said to be the victims. And the real victims are denied lawful treatment because they are said to be capitalist oppressors or racists. And this point is most evident in the United States in cities controlled by so-called progressives. These are liberal Democrats who are simply more consistent with their philosophy of relativism, relativism ethics, and statism. So they protect the lawless and they penalize the lawful. And then they wonder why things go from bad to worse. In the name of love, fairness, justice, and compassion, they turn their cities into lawless hell holes. Leftists in their quest for humanistic paradise turn society into a vicious, lawless, unproductive, chaotic mess. Look at Cuba. Look at the communist nations. The least qualified rule because they are chosen by evil fools. People willingly and freely choose slavery to the oppressive Bramble State. It's really sad and tragic because uh, the communities that it's supp supposedly is going to help uh, end up much worse off. Look at any socialist country. Now, a secondary application is that good Christian men are happy and content in their lawful callings, fulfilling the dominion mandate, and do not like seeking a dictatorial control over others. <coughs> good men are happy being productive for God and for their fellow man. They realize that the road to greatness is the way of the servant, as Jesus taught in Matthew 10, 42 to 45. The only kind of men who lust after political authority for its own sake are bramble men, unproductive men who seek to attain fame and fortune by taking it from others who are productive. Think of Obama and think of Biden. Never earned an honest buck in their life. And this explains why career politicians and those who are members of the so-called swamp are usually so corrupt and unconcerned with real truth or justice. The original intent of our founders, where members of Congress lived in their districts, worked real jobs, and spent very little time in Washington, makes sense when we look at how secular humanism and the rise of statism has perverted everything into a quest for power over others. They're so out of touch. And they, they have to lie to maintain their worldview. They cannot admit they're wrong. And we know, I mean, look, look the Democratic-controlled cities are hellholes because antinomianism, rewarding the criminal and penalizing the productive, doesn't work. The modern state sees coercion and the force of arbitrary laws and regulations as necessary for the people's own good. Humanists believe in salvation by law, that is, by autonomous positivistic law of an all-powerful state. Now let's look at Jotham's application of, of his fable. And uh, <clears throat> this is uh, verse 16 to 21. Now, therefore, if you've acted in truth and sincerity in making Abimelech king, and if you have dealt with Jeroboam in his house and have done to him as he deserves, for my father fought for you, risked his life, and delivered you out of the hand of Midian, but you have risen up against my father's house this day and killed his seventy sons on one stone, and made Abimelech the son of a female servant king over the men of Shechem, because he is your brother. If then you have acted in truth and sincerity with Jeroboam and with his house this day, then rejoice in Abimelech, and let him rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and Beth Milo. And let fire come from the men of Shechem and Beth Milo and devour Abimelech. 
And Jotham ran away and fled, and he went to Pierre and dwelt there for fear of Imelech his brother. Now, although Jotham's parabolic story is perfectly clear, it's very easy to understand, he nevertheless applies it like a prophet. He points out their crimes, emphasizing the heinousness of their behavior and the judgment they deserve. The statement is scornful and mocking, for the application assumes their guilt, but is spoken in a manner designed to focus their attention on the great weaknesses and injustice of their actions. It is given in a series of comparisons of what ought to have been done, but what then they actually did. First, there are the issues of truth, sincerity, and justice. Was the making of Abimelech king done because of truth and integrity of heart? The people of Shechem know very well that the coup was based on lies and wicked motives. Then to drive home the wickedness and treachery of their actions, he reminds them the many good things that Jeroboam had done for them. Did Gideon deserve to have all of his sons murdered except one who escaped? Gideon risked his own life. He fought for the people. He delivered them out of the hand of Midian. So the men of Shechem rewarded good, righteous behavior, courageous behavior with treachery and murder. So he's aggravating their guilt. Gideon had left behind many sons in Ophrah to honor his house and carry on godly dominion in his name. And they were cut off unjustly solely to fulfill the evil desires of a Baal worshiper. Jotham then plainly states their crimes. They murdered Gideon's sons for the son of an evil slave woman. Because they agreed with the conspiracy and they paid for it, they were just as guilty as Abimelech and his criminal comrades. And then second, Jotham appeals to the curses of the covenant, the covenant law. If they acted it according to sincerity, uh, according to truth with sincerity of heart, they should rejoice in Abimelech and in themselves. They did the right thing. Now what is left unsaid, uh, but is assumed in this if statement, by the way, structurally the whole thing is extremely complicated with a bunch of ifs. <clears throat> is that acting in accordance with God's law will bring covenant blessings. If you follow God's law, if you follow what God says to do, if you act with justice and integrity and sincerity of heart, obeying God's law, you're going to be blessed. Rejoice. You'll be blessed. Jotham is applying the biblical world and life view to these wicked idolaters. If their actions were true and just or fully in agreement with God's law, they should rejoice because God's going to bless them. But if their deeds were not in agreement with Scripture or justice as defined by Yahweh, then God's judgment will come upon them. Fire, death and destruction, will come out of Abimelech and devour them. And then fire will come out of Abimelech's supporters to devour him. God will punish the crime done by Abimelech and those who financed and supported Abimelech by causing them to turn against each other with great violence and slaughter. Now, we're not going to get to that today, but it's extremely shocking what happens. The certainty of this judicial prediction of doom was fulfilled so perfectly, it must be regarded as prophetic. Or one could argue that Jotham understood God's law so well that he knew covenant sanctions would come on such wicked apostates. It seems it's a prophecy. Well, there are some crucial lessons here for believers regarding the spiritual war we are in for the sake of Christ's kingdom first. <clears throat> our strength and unity in this world lies in our faith and obedience to God's word. Believers are portrayed as living godly, productive lives, faithfully living the gospel, and laboring honestly in their uh, respective callings. We are united by our world and life view. We, we all have, or at least we should have, the same standard of ethics, justice, truth, and meaning. We reject human autonomy and have as our sole standard for faith and life the Bible, the, the 66 books of the Old and New Testament. If we faithfully preach the gospel and apply the moral law to our lives, churches, and societies, we can expect spiritual and numerical growth over time. 
Covenant faithfulness over a long period of time leads to covenant blessings. So like a prophet, he's preaching the blessings of the covenant law and, of course, is the curses for the disobedience to the law. Second, we are taught here that secular humanism, apostasy, and a commitment to human autonomy leads to chaos, violence, disunity, and the mutual destruction of humanistic antagonists over time. Civilizations based on arbitrary, positivistic concepts of ethics, truth, law, and justice destroy themselves over time because their first principles or worldviews cater to man's sinful lust for autonomy from God and power over others. The North is good. Gary North's good on this. Humanism is a power religion. And the symbol of humanism is the pyramid. In all pagan cultures throughout the whole world, the symbol of the religion were all pyramids. Egypt, the Yucatan Peninsula, Mexico, South America, they all founded their civilizations on humanism. Paganism and humanism is the same. <clears throat> Humanistic politicians cannot appeal to genuine truths or real transcendent ethics for unity, justice, solutions, and support. So they appeal to envy, lies, distortions, class or race hatred, idolatrous forms of nationalism, and raw, unlawful power as their platform. That's all they can do. Nazism, the whole thing was based on lies. The idea that the Jews stabbed the country in the back and that's why they lost the war, it's all a lie. They lost the war. And if they didn't surrender, the armies would have marched right into Germany. Same with Stalin and Marxism and, and Lenin. Oh, you're being oppressed by the wealthy. They were not. Yeah, there were some abuses. The, the government they had was pretty corrupt. But communism was way worse. From the frying pan into the fire. Because the people have no absolutes or transcendent truths to appeal to, True lasting agreement and genuine unity is impossible. Consequently, they turn to statism, oppression, coercion, and violence. As humanistic states become more consistent with their worldviews over time, they become less free, more tyrannical, and cultural rot or decay sets in. And this is obvious. I'm not going to take the time, but just if you understand history, it's, it's so obvious. Man's task under God is godly dominion under biblical law. Man's rule is to be receptively reconstructive. That is, we don't determine truth, meaning, and ethics. We learn it from the word of God, and then we learn to apply it to society. Receptively reconstructive. And thus ministerial, not creative or autonomous, and thus dictatorial. The modern state, humanism, there's nothing above them. You obey what we say, or you're going to go to jail. And they don't have uh, this idea of justice being objective and transcendent and fair. They don't have that at all. If you're a left-winger and you riot and you burn places down and you commit murder and all sorts of things, nothing happens. Uh, if you're a white right-wing lunatic and you go into the Capitol building and sit in a chair and maybe offend a few people, uh, you get locked up. There's no justice. Man's task under God is godly dominion. A civilization based on scripture and God's moral law will have a Christian work ethic and will acquire great capital and prosperity over time. And even secular uh, people who studied this, they came up with the idea of the Puritan work ethic. That's why northern countries in Europe, countries that were not under Roman Catholicism but were under Protestantism, became the greatest places on earth to live and the most lawful and the most prosperous economically the Christian work ethic, the Protestant work ethic, Puritanism. A society based on humanism, coercion and theft, will have an expanding state and military over time, but the people will be turned into slaves of the state or cogs in the machine. That's just the way it is. And it's the most obvious in fascist and socialist countries. Fascism is just a form of socialism. Uh, it, you know, with fascism, people have the illusion of having private property, but there's so many regulations and the state controls everything. It's actually wiser than socialism in the fact that people think they're free, they think they're more free, and they're more productive, and the state confiscates their excess wealth. R.J. Rushdoony says this. 
This is from the Institutes, page 451. God grants dominion to man under his law, but he does not grant his, uh, he does not grant his sovereignty. God alone is absolute Lord and sovereign. To deny God's sovereignty is to transfer sovereignty from God to man or to man's state. Thus Thomas Paine and the rights of man affirmed as a fundamental principle the sovereignty of a nation state declaring, quote, the nation is essentially the source of all sovereignty, nor can any individual or any body of men be entitled to any authority which is not expressly derived from it, that is from the state. End of quote. Paine and the French Revolution clearly affirmed their totalitarianism by the statement, the state as God became the source of authority, morality, and dominion. Quite logically, the revolution became a boot grinding down the face of man, but by the grace of God, not forever. End of quote. After delivering the parabolic rebuke with a promise of coming judgment, Jotham fled for his life and moved to Beer, a small town on the road from Jerusalem to Gaza, far to the south. He would never be found there. He knew that Abimelech would do everything in his power to murder him, as he had done to his brothers. And then, just very briefly, uh, we'll look at rebellion against Abimelech's reign. Twenty-two to twenty-nine. I won't get through all of this. I'll just get through a few of these verses. After Abimelech had reigned over Israel three days, God sent a spirit of ill will between Abimelech and the men of Shechem, and men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech, that the crime done to the seventy sons of Jeroboam might be settled, and their blood be laid on Abimelech their brother, who killed them and on the men of Shechem, who aided him in the killing of his brothers. And the men of Shechem set men in ambush against him on the tops of the mountains, and they robbed all who passed by along the way, and it was told to Abimelech. Now Gael, the son of Ebed, came with his brothers and went over to Shechem, and the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. So they went out into the fields and gathered grapes from their vineyards and trod them and made merry. And they went into the house of their god and ate and drank and cursed Abimelech. Then Gael, the son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech and who is Shechem that we should serve him? Is he not the son of Jeroboam, and is not Zebel his officer? Serve the men of Hamar, the father of Shechem, and why should we serve him? If only this people were under my authority, then I would remove Abimelech. So he said to Abimelech, increase your army and come out. It did not take long for Abimelech to encounter serious problems in his reign. After only three years, God's judgment begins to fall upon him and on the Shechemites who made him king. Although the text is silent, it is likely that only Ephraim and Manasseh acknowledged him as king. I noted that. <clears throat> Israel was very decentralized at this time. The other tribes just really didn't care what was going on up in the north. Sad to say. Verses 22, 23 and 24 explain the whole section to follow. And we'll just look at that briefly. And give us crucial details about God's special providence over world events. God sent an evil spirit, a demon, to cause conflict between Abimelech and the men of Shechem, his original supporters. This teaches us that God is sovereign over all events and that even Satan and the fallen angels are totally under his control. The devil has a certain type of rule and influence, but only as God permits and decrees. Now, any idea that Satan has an independent rule and can do as he desires is paganism. It is a denial of God's absolute power and control over his creation, whether physical or spiritual. Satan and his demons, the demons that are under him, love to do evil, and they love to cause conflict, chaos, hatred, and violence among men. They can't strike at God, so they strike at God's image. And thus at that time, uh, are chosen by God to cause judgment and calamity as judicial retribution for wickedness by unbelievers. Now in 1 Kings 22, 21-23, we read about the Lord putting a lying spirit in the mouth of uh, Micaiah's false prophets in order to cause him to go into battle where he will be killed. Although Yahweh is never the author of sin, he controls circumstances in such a manner that evil men are often destroyed by their own free acts of wickedness. 
these are just judicial acts and not arbitrary punishments. Evil thinking prepares its own punishment. Because God is holy, righteous, and just, he is obliged by his own nature and character to punish wicked acts, to punish evil. Because he is just, the punishment always perfectly fits the crime. The devil can tempt Christians, but because believers are regenerated and made holy by the Spirit of God, they can resist the devil. And we pray every day, God, protect us from evil, or protect us from the evil one. Men who are unregenerate, and thus evil, are easily manipulated by Satan. Their hearts are already full of warring thoughts and evil concepts, so it is not hard for demons to stimulate them to further warrings and despicable actions. It's kind of shocking to think about. Now, it says we don't make war against flesh and blood. In Ephesians, we war against principalities and powers in the air, which are the demonic forces. But the demonic forces, you know, they can't pick up a knife and stab you, but they can influence wicked men to do crazy, wicked things. Now, they're on a leash by God. They can't do anything without God approving of it or, or uh, allowing it to happen. So men's own sin brings judgment and in this case, is used to expedite their punishment as well. In Romans 1, Paul speaks of God giving men over to vile passions as a punishment for the rebellion. Romans 1, 26. The receiving of the truth and living a holy life is totally dependent on God's grace and mercy. Totally dependent on God and His Spirit and Christ. But a life of wickedness, vanity, and foolishness leading to destruction is fallen man's natural course. And John Owen talks about this in his work on the Holy Spirit. The wicked man swims down the stream of, swim, of sin. He goes with the flow. He fulfills his lusts. The pagan is swimming against the flow, fighting the sinful flesh at all times. Now, the reason for the coming judgment is that Abimelech is guilty of murdering Gideon's sons, and the men of Shechem are guilty of supporting these murderers. Premeditated murder and the shedding of innocent blood is a death penalty offense in Scripture, Exodus 21, 12 to 14. It is a sin so wicked and heinous that, figuratively speaking, the shed blood of the innocent uh, cries out from the ground for justice. Genesis 4.10, the story of Cain and Abel. Yahweh is the giver of life. He has created man in his own image and likeness. Genesis 1.27. Therefore, <clears throat> men can only take life under certain circumstances set forth by God. The civil magistrate can apply the death penalty for murder, for example. Also, you can, if somebody's trying to kill you, you can use self-defense. And there's such a thing as a lawful war. Because they committed murder in an atmosphere of lawlessness where the civil and religious authorities are the murderers, and there's no one to whom Jotham can appeal for justice, God himself will mete out the retribution. And we noted that earlier. Sooner or later, God will make inquisition for blood, innocent blood, and will return it on the heads of those who shed it. They will have the cup of wrath, the cup of blood given to them to drink, for they earned it. They deserve it. They are worthy. All murderers will pay for their crime, if not in this world, then in the world to come on the day of judgment. I just saw on the news a man who committed a horrible murder and rape 49 years ago was just caught probably through DNA. DNA, they're catching all these old murderers who got away with it, you know, for a while anyway. But you don't get away with anything in God's universe. God, God will make you pay. All modern states that have eliminated the death penalty for murder have denied the victim's justice and have exhibited a wicked, antinomian, humanistic compassion. The compassion of the wicked is cruel. Proverbs 12.10 Modern civil magistrates have declared war on God's law and have asserted the supremacy of the state's humanistic law over God's law by allowing murderers to live and by allowing people to murder the unborn in abortion. Modern states are calling down the wrath of God on their nations. There will be probably a World War III. There will be a Great Depression unless the West and the, these nations repent. You can't murder 50 million babies and have God look the other way. You just can't get away with it. God will not tolerate that. 
The passage also teaches that accessories and conspirators of murder are guilty of it and have merited the death penalty for their crime. The Shechemites conspired with Abimelech and then approved and financed his plan. God, therefore, will by special providence carry out the death penalty against them by Abimelech himself. Those who formed a league to shed the blood of the innocent will be justly set against each other to the point of death. God takes this party and that party and he smashes them together. And this, beloved, is poetic justice. Those in our society who support those who support infanticide, abortion on demand, with the voices, money, and votes, with their voices, money, and votes, are heaping up the wrath of God on themselves. You know, Paul in Romans 1, he said, God not only, the wrath of God's not only going to fall on these people who practice these things, he's talking about lesbianism, homosexuality, and things like that, but also those who support them. They are co-conspirators in the shedding of innocent blood. The application of our text to modern day Christians is clear and strong. If we do not oppose humanistic, bramble leadership in our nation by seeking to extend the kingdom of God to the point where our nation covenants with Christ and explicitly submits to his law word, then we have denied the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, the applicability of the moral law to all men and nations, the moral law is universal, and the kingship of the resurrected Redeemer over everything in heaven and on earth. Of course, Matthew 28, Psalm 2, Psalm 110, etc. To accept a bramble humanistic leadership in the name of a of a false two-kingdom theory, or a dispensational concept of God's law, or an erroneous concept of pietism, or an unjustified severe restriction of the concept of Jesus' kingdom on earth, is a heretical, unconditional surrender to the brambles of this world. Think of all those Lutheran generals, some of which were very faithful, dedicated Lutherans. Now, Hitler didn't like them, but they served in Hitler's army, and they are guilty of the blood of millions of people. His name was Heinrich. He was the greatest defensive general. Hitler hated him because he went to church. He refused to join the Nazi party. He didn't like the Nazis. But he served Hitler because of the two-kingdom theory that comes from Lutheranism. Jesus is king over the state and all areas of life. And we'll end with this quote from Rush Dooney. <clears throat> The first and basic duty of the state is to further the kingdom of God by recognizing the sovereignty of God in his word and conforming itself to the law word of God. The state thus has a duty to be Christian. It must be Christian even as man, the family, the church, the school, and all things else must be Christian. To hold otherwise is to assert the death of God in the sphere of the state. Because of its failure to require that the state be Christian, because of its implicit death of God theology, this church has surrendered the state to apostate reason and the devil. The church has done this because it has denied the law of God. It has, in fact, implied that God is dead outside the walls of the church and then must logically proclaim his death within the church. End of quote. We'll end there. Christians surrendered the United States to secular humanists. And they did it because of their faith in pluralism. And they put their faith in the Constitution instead of their faith in the Word of God. Constitution, we have the best Constitution in the world. But it has one fatal flaw. It does not explicitly recognize Christ as King. There's not an explicit recognition uh, that we need to covenant with Christ and submit to the law of God as our moral standard. It's a humanistic document. As good as it is, because they were strongly influenced by Christians and a lot of the founders were, were definitely Christians. You've got to submit to Christ. We have to reject Bramble King leadership. We have to reject secular humanism, do everything we can to fight against it. And that involves applying the whole word of God to every area of life. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this amazing section of scripture, so full of wisdom and truth. Ingrain it in our hearts and minds, Lord. Help us to obey. First, by governing ourselves and governing our families and governing how we do our callings in life and being faithful to Christ and supporting churches that are faithful, that are willing to apply the law to all areas of life. In Jesus' name, amen.